We're on our second to last video in a 20 part video series on Bible study. And this one might be my favorite lesson yet because it's changing the Bible from just a book report to an actual life changing book. And that's what happens through the process of application. Hello church, I'm excited that you've been learning with me on how to study God's word. If this is your first video, my name is Ryan Wrench, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Temecula, California. And we've been recording a video series to try to help our church grow in knowing Jesus. So stay tuned to the very end to see how we're trying to do that every single week. But with that, enjoy this week's video. Hello and welcome back. This is class number 19 out of 20. This is our second to the last class on Bible study. And I've enjoyed it. I mentioned so much about the recap in the last video. And so I'll just do a quick review. And then we're going to end off today with the most important step of Bible study, which is application. So we see that in the steps we've been following by reading the text. Actually, step one half was choosing the text, but we read the text and then we reread the text and we'll flag words to figure out which words um, we need to get a new definition on or which ones are repeating. And then we'll boil it down to a word, expand that word to a phrase, and then uh, really try to summarize the text in a sentence. And we'll flip that sentence around into a question. And if the text is asking a question, then we're digging the answers out of the text. And as we look at our text as a whole, we're arriving at a big idea. We're arriving at a, a, a tree, at, a, at one big cohesive idea. And we've been framing it from the sense of uh, just saying, okay, if somebody asks you in your Bible reading, what did you read today? Or if you're thinking back on yesterday's devotions, or if you're preparing for a sermon or a Sunday school lesson, and you're thinking, what am I teaching on today? What am I preaching on today? What did I read about today? Then you're taking home a rock rather than a handful of sand. Not a bunch of ideas, but you're trying to take home an idea to meditate on, to allow to get into your soul. And so, um, so when we boil it down to one big idea, then we want to, after that step, not just stop there, but step number 10 there is apply the truth. Apply to truth. Uh, apply the truth. And so today we'll talk all about application. We've said that we have started big with observation, and then interpretation is finding the meaning of the text, figuring out what God said and what God is saying. And then we want to come down to the point, what is God saying to me? Now, application is probably the most important step, uh, but it's also the most dangerous. I, I say it's the most important because it's what makes the Bible real and what brings faith to um, your own life, but it's dangerous because it can be applied incorrectly. Remember our example about the guy that, that flopped open his Bible and said, well, Judas went and hanged himself. If there was an application to his own life, he would have some tough neck burns, you know? There was, there was just, uh, there, there needs to be scriptural guidelines for applying the truth of the scriptures to ourselves. We need to actually apply what God is actually saying. And so it's very, very important um, because we have, to, we have to not just view the Bible like it's an ancient book, like it's just an old uh, book of myths or stories or fairy tales. And so, uh, part one and part two are talking about the, the language of the Bible in the terms of the Bible. Um, but many people know a lot about that. They'll look at the Bible and just study it from a literature standpoint. They'll think it's just a, another collection of, of, you know, it's a, it's a King James Bible and it comes out in the 1600s. So it's this kind of medieval collection of myths and stories and, and we're saying, well, no, it's not just a book of literature to be studied from the literature standpoint, uh, but many people stop, stop right there. Many people are, are, are good people, and they've studied the Bible. They've memorized the Bible. They can recite lots of verses. 
They know all the Bible stories. They know all about David. They know all about Jesus. And they might even be very sincere people. I've met a lot of them where, where they've grown up in church. They've read the Bible many times. They've studied the Bible. They can rattle off verses. They know theology. They know all about the Bible stories. And yet, they've never actually taken the scriptural truths and applied them to their own lives. They know the Bible, but they don't obey God. And what a shame to know all about the Bible, to know all about God, but to not know God. I, I, I think application is the most important step because it's helping us take this Bible and take the stories and the highlights and the big points of Scripture, but actually make it mean something to us and to actually bring it home to us. I mean, you can know about the disciples of Jesus, but are, are you a disciple of Jesus? You can know about the faith of Daniel that closed the mouths of the lions, but do you have that kind of faith in God? He, he prayed, and we can read about the prayers of David and Solomon, but do you pray like that? We know Paul prayed, but do I pray like Paul and the list of people that, that, that he prayed for? We can know about the suffering, the people who suffered for Jesus Christ and, and Stephen being martyred for Jesus Christ, but would I be willing to suffer like that? Would I be willing to be thrown into prison and sing hymns like they did in the Bible? Would I be willing to stand for God like Noah when nobody else in my culture is standing for God? Um, so those are when the questions get real. Those are when the Bible characters stop just being old mythological people that we think, you know, well, it's just, it's just mythology. No, we need to think of them as real life people who took real life stands for God. And we have to say, am I, am I willing to be like that? I know the scriptures talk about these people and we kind of lift them up on a higher plane sometimes, but wait a minute, they're just humans just like you and me. And so we need to study the Bible for what it actually is saying to us. We might know all about church, but the question is, do we study the scriptures and learn uh, to truly worship God. We might know all about music, but are we actually singing true praise to the Lord? We might be able to articulate and argue all kinds of fine doctrines here, but, but are they changing our lives? We might know, yes, yes, God is omnipresent, but does that change what we do in private? I'm just saying, man, we got to make this Bible real, not just the head knowledge, but actually apply it to our lives. We don't need to know just about the Philistines and the Egyptians and the Samaritans and the Jews, but we need to know how their lives uh, uh, interacted with one another and, and how that, uh, the, the faith in God plays into that. We might know all about holiness, but are we living holy? Man, those are... Those are the questions that get down to the real life stuff. That makes Christianity real. That's what Christianity is made of, is application. So this final step of Bible study is what's making the Bible real. It's, it's what's giving the Bible, I guess we could say, effectiveness. This, this shows the power of God um, through application in Christians' lives. When the Holy Spirit is in you and He's truly doing a work in you and you want to know God more and you want to draw nigh to God like we talked about at the close of the last lesson and, and, and as close as you want to get to God, well, you search the Scriptures for what He's saying to you and then you actually obey the Scriptures. Now, we're asking the question, not just what is God saying, but, but what is God saying to me? So we've already said, what is God saying here? As long as we're careful about what God said in the past, then His Word is timeless. We're able to bridge that to today's world and then bring it to what is God saying to me. So this is what God said, and truly He is still saying those things still today. 
through the scriptures. And so step number 10 is just that application stage. When we've, when we've tried to be careful with the words of God, find the interpretation of the scriptures, then we can bridge that, that those two worlds, the biblical world with our world, and apply God's truth to our lives. Now, there's the, ap- there's, there's the truth here, but the application is going to be so different. I mean, we're going to have a pretty narrow focus on the truth here. But the way that it looks in your life is going to be way different than it looks in my life. And it's going to look way different than it looked 500 years ago. So the application is where this, where this changes, where this uh, is a little bit different. So when we're coming to the application stage, we want to just stop and say, okay, what, what did I learn from my Bible reading today? What did I learn from that sermon yesterday? What am I learning from the scriptures? How am I allowing it to change me? And so it can be from one word of a study that you've done. It can be from a phrase of scripture. It can be from a a topic that you've been dwelling on and meditating on. Or it could be from the big idea that we've been learning how to study and to mine out of the scriptures. Whatever it is, you stop and say, God, what are you trying to say to me from this? What do you want me to do differently? Uh, how do you want me to grow from this, God? Um, uh, this, this has really challenged me in this area. And you start to get specific about certain things that God's done. And man, this is where the hard work begins. This is where it gets really difficult because you have to be honest before God. And he knows if you're being dishonest. You actually you can't hide anything from him. You, you, you actually have to just say what's really on your heart because it's just between you and God. And there's no hiding things from him anymore. So you've got to come to God and it's a, it, it's a flaying open of your heart. It's, it, it's starting by prayer and asking God to... Uh, to, to change your life or to expose things in your life that are not supposed to be there. And, and it's, it's asking God to lead you and to change you. And if he exposes something wrong in you, some sin in you, to give you the strength from the Holy Spirit to be able to change that, whatever it is. And so the application phase is a, I mean, it's a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching thing. It's a difficult phase. But that's where true spiritual growth happens. When we have this this openness before God to just do whatever he wants with us, that's such a precious place to come to. That's such a wonderful place to come where I've studied the scriptures, but I want the scriptures to change me. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So it's interesting that he connects doing with deception, or I should say not doing with deception, right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So it's almost like he's saying, I've got to, when I hear the word of God, I've got to figure out a way to do the Word of God or else I'm being deceived. And that's a scary concept because nobody likes to be tricked, right? Nobody likes to be deceived. I hate finding out um, that I was tricked later on and, oh man, somebody's talking behind my back or they tricked me into thinking this and and I feel so embarrassed. I, I just... I can't believe that happened to me. I should have seen that coming. And all these things we say when we're deceived and we find out later that we had been deceived. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you deceived right now? And if you say, well, no, I'm not deceived. How do you know you're not deceived? Oh, man. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. How do I know I'm not deceived? Because if you knew you weren't deceived, you wouldn't be deceived. So, so the question is, are, are you deceived right now? Do you, 
do, do you believe you're tricked? And in some ways, you go, well, I'm just not sure. But then when we look at the scriptures, it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so a way to make sure that we are not deceived The way to make sure we're not self-deceived, which is sometimes the worst kind of deception, is when you're blinding yourself to your own problems. So the way to expose self-deception is what? To be a doer of the word. To, when the scriptures expose something in you, when the Bible exposes something in you that we actually say, okay, How can I do that? How can I put that into practice? I've heard the sermon. I've heard the the scriptures. I've studied the Bible, and it has exposed something in me. Now, what do I do different now? How can I put this into practice? I actually want, I don't want to be self-deceived, so I want to be a doer of the word today. So I'm actually going to change something. For instance, if you're reading... Uh, 1 Thessalonians, a, um, uh, one of the men from our church was just preaching um, 1 Thessalonians, and I'll skip down to verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Uh, um, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his uh, kingdom and glory. And so we can look at a text like that. Maybe we would do some Bible study on that, and we would say, okay, I see his labor and travail and Uh, not wanting to be chargeable to them, and he's holy and just and unblameable in front of them, and he exhorted and comforted and charged them. So he's giving of himself, he's, um, he's sacrificing, he's working, he's doing so much. Why? Verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God. So Paul's saying, man, I'm sacrificing uh, for you so that you would walk worthy of God. So if we're looking at this and kind of trying to boil it down to uh, put it into our own words, in a sense, we might say, um, Paul's desire to see the Thessalonians walk worthy drove him to self-sacrifice. Now, we might look at a text and do our Bible reading and notice all the things. Boy, he worked really hard. He, uh, he didn't want to charge them. He wanted to work so that they wouldn't get the excuse that he's just trying to take money from them. He, he was holy and just and unblameable. He worked really uh, hard on his personal character while he was there. Um, he, he worked really hard in relationships. He exhorted and comforted and charged them while he was there. And so we can look at that and say, oh boy, he really cared. He wanted them to walk worthy of the Lord. So he sacrificed like crazy for them. That's nice. Okay, going on with my day. Now, we can do a Bible study on all those words and learn about the sacrifice of the Apostle Paul and learn about labor and travail and working hard and all of that. But if you stop there in Bible study and just set that aside and say, that's nice for the Apostle Paul, but I'm going to go on in my day and and just kind of do my own thing. I'm not going to change anything about my own life then we're missing Bible study. We're missing the point of Bible study. We want to do Bible study that changes us, that we can apply it to our own lives. So instead of just stopping there and saying, wow, look at all these great things that the Apostle Paul did, we want to to look at some of these things at our own life and say, where have I sacrificed lately? I know Paul is really good at sacrificing, but what about me? Have, have I sacrificed lately? I mean, he's, he's working extra jobs so that he's not chargeable to them. I, I wonder if even in my finances, have I, have I sacrificed in my, my finances lately? 
man, I, I should, I, I should really lean into that, and I, I should use some of my finances to to benefit other people. If I could do that, so that others could walk worthy and uh, and, and expand His kingdom and glory, like it says in verse twelve, then then I'm going to lean into that. I want to sacrifice in the same way Paul did. And so maybe it's like when I was a youth pastor, we tried to say, let's, let's do a dollar a week for church planting. Let's give a dollar a week for church planting. And as a, as a youth group, we started raising funds all year that we took to a conference for church planting at the end of the year. And it was something simple. It was some way, though, to say, I don't want to just be a... Uh, uh, a hearer of the word and not a doer. I actually want to be a doer of the word, so I'm not self-deceived. So we say I want to sacrifice my money, or or it says uh, uh, the amount of time that the apostle Paul took. We can look at our own time and say, where's my time going? And if he sacrificed his time for people, then what am I spending my time on this week? If he worked, he it says he labored and travailed. For the sake of other people, then I, I want to look at myself and say, okay, where, where am I working? Where am I laboring and travailing for the benefit of other people? And, and we have to make the Bible mean something to our lives, not just a Bible study about Paul, but if he worked and he gave and he sacrificed for other people uh, so that they would walk worthy of God, well, again, how can we do that? So, so saying, okay, I want to make the Bible real, then that, that means making a plan. Actually coming up with specific ideas that you say, so that I'm not self-deceived, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to be a doer of the word. It talks about labor and travail. If Paul labored and travailed, then man, I, I want to work. I want to work to bless others. Maybe my work is is simple yard work or simple uh, assembly for uh, you know maybe it's gift bags or baskets that can be taken to people that uh, that need the gospel or or working might be some project going on to help somebody and it's some kind of repair work you know what is it that you can do to work to bless other people um, maybe it's the time commitment and. And we saw the time from the scriptures. Boy, Paul must have spent a lot of time helping people. And you analyze your own time and say, okay, what am I putting the most time into? Is it some kind of entertainment? Is it some kind of hobby? Is it something that I'm just pouring so much time compared to the, the time that I'm putting in spiritual things? Well, hmm, maybe I need to spend more time on spiritual things. So I'm going to limit the time on this thing maybe to an hour and I'm going to spend more time on, on laboring and travailing in spiritual things. I'm going to put a greater emphasis tomorrow in my schedule on these things in my time. I'm going to, I'm going to actually write encouraging notes or I'm going to spend my time um, um, reading this book and name the book that you're going to read as a as a beneficial thing for you in place of the time you were spending on self. Maybe the time that you're um, uh, challenged from the scriptures on is in exercising and, and helping your body or in working for your family or in blessing other people. Whatever it is, whatever it is, actually make a plan and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to work. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to give in this area. And that's how we make the, that's how we make the Bible uh, real application is that is that is that final stage of of bringing the Bible home of making the Bible relevant to our lives. It can't just be a book about uh, about past Christians or past believers who've done so much for God. I want to be included in that list of believers who are doing things for God, and so application helps that. So. Uh, uh, in your Bible study, in a sermon, in a way of where we're, in any time we're trying to make the Bible mean something to us, then we'll start with prayer. We'll ask the Lord to expose something or give us something or help us believe something. We'll study the scriptures and then we'll apply the scriptures to our own life. 
and then it helps to just conclude in prayer by by asking for God's strength. Bringing the Lord into every step of Bible study is, is crucial to Bible study. God, help me to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. That is the point of Bible study, to know God, to know God's will, to know how to help people, to know how to take the scriptures from from an old, dry, boring book and making it come alive in my own life. That's a wonderful, wonderful chance, uh, a, a potential of what Bible study is. I said all the way back at the beginning of the class, maybe in lesson one or two, that I think this is one of the most important topics you could ever study because the Bible applies to every aspect of life. It is the thing that drives all of the other classes you might take. And we have to be accurate with the scriptures. And and, and this is how we know God. The Holy Spirit's power working through his word is what helps us draw nigh to God. And he'll draw nigh to you. So in our next class, we'll end by just looking at a few more examples of bringing the Bible home, of trying to study the scriptures for Uh, looking for ways that we can actually apply it to our own lives. And hopefully through the examples and through the training of this whole uh, lesson series, it's it's been a way to say, I'm I'm so thankful that I understand the Bible, that I'm, I'm confident that I can open up the scriptures and wherever I turn, I can be able to hear God's voice to me accurately and clearly. God bless you in your Bible study. I'm looking forward to the next and the final lesson in our series. We'll see you then. Well, thank you for watching this video from our 20-part series on Bible study. I realize this kind of content or our Baptist perspective might not be for everyone, and I don't want to waste your time, but if you did find it helpful or enjoyable, Would you subscribe to our channel? We're releasing videos every Monday at noon Pacific Standard Time, and I just want to help you bring the Bible home. So we'll see you maybe in person this Sunday at our church. That's it for now. God bless you, church. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.